colleagues, European Public Health Alliance, and the European Society for Pediatric Oncology, it is my great pleasure to open this policy dialogue on the revision of the EU regulations on medicines for children and for rare disease. My name is Guy Muller. I work for the Dutch Cancer Society, heading the international public affairs work, and I'm the founder of the European Fair Pricing Network, EFPN, one of the hosting organizations of today. The dialogue we are having today is taking place in a crucial moment in time, as the public consultation on the two regulations have only recently been opened. For the first time in nearly 20 years, the regulations on rare and pediatric diseases are being reviewed. It is therefore a great opportunity to shape future-proof legislative frameworks and a sustainable ecosystem for patients and healthcare systems. Today, we will discuss together with our panelists and you, our audience, the shortcomings, existing gaps, and move the discussion ahead to identify new pathways forward to ensure a patient-centric approach and transparency, all with the aim of guaranteeing access to much needed medicines for all European patients. With this in mind, the organizing parties came together to deliver joint recommendations on how to improve the current system from the civil society's perspective. And these will also be presented and discussed today. In our view, the future regulation should deliver a sustainable, patient-centric and transparent ecosystem. So what can you expect today? With this dialogue, we want to tap in and contribute to the ongoing policy discussions, bring patient and civil society together on how to improve these regulations. That's why we have invited excellent experts with different backgrounds to inform us, address shortcoming, and propose and discuss recommendations. The agenda is divided in two segments. The first panel focuses on orphan medical products and the second on pediatrics. The dialogue will be moderated by Yanis Nazis, policy manager for IFA and member of the management board of the European Medicine Association, EMA, who will further introduce the panelists. On housekeeping, as we are all experts when it comes to Zoom meetings these days, I will keep it rather short. This is a view only event, which means you will be able to contribute by typing your questions in the Q&A function. Our moderator will take as many questions as possible, sometimes group them, but of course we cannot guarantee that. And of course, during Zoom meetings, the camera needs to fall out, else it's not a good Zoom meeting. Uh, the second housekeeping rule, please take part and follow the conversation by tweeting using the hashtag Let's Talk Access. And last, this session is public and will be recorded. You'll receive an email with the recording, policy recommendations, and other materials in the coming weeks. I want to briefly thank all the organizations that have contributed to this day, the ECL, the EFPN, IFA, and SIOP Europe. Without further ado, I will pass the floor to our moderator, Yanis Nazis. Yanis, the floor is yours. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Welcome to this very timely event. Um, the first uh, part will focus on the orphan regulation. I'm delighted to be joined today by Dr. Beata Wiesler, who is the head of the uh, Pharmaceutical Evaluation Department of the German HTA agency, IQIC, um, Professor Dr. Wolf D uh, Dieter Ludwig. Uh, Wolf Dieter, he is a hematologist uh, and he is also the um, representative of healthcare professionals on the uh, European Medicines Agency Management Board and um, a, a member of the Drug Evaluation Committee of the German Medical Association. Ward Rommel, Ward Rommel uh, comes from the um, Flemish uh, Cancer League, a Stand Up Against Cancer, and he is a member of the ECL Access to Medicines Task Force. And of course, uh, last but not least, Kaya Katorska from DG Sante from the European Commission. So we will hear from different perspectives uh, in a very timely manner. Uh, if we could have, uh, if we could see our panelists, please, if you can open your cameras. 
and we can dig into directly. Welcome, Kaya. Good to see you. Wolf Dieter, Beata, and Ward. Wolf Dieter, if you could lower your camera just a bit, please, so we can see you better. Thank you very much. So the first question, because we have very concrete um, uh, timetable. Wolf Dieter, from your perspective, uh, also as a hematologist, what have you seen in the rare disease field, especially in cancer, over the past years with the orphanization of the pharmaceutical regulation? Are you encouraged? Are you concerned? If yes, in what way? Okay, first of all, Janis, thank you very much for inviting me to this very interesting exchange of ideas and to share with you the possibility to share with you my suggestions. During the last decade, there has been a market increase in the number of orphan drugs in the EU and about two thirds of the applications for a designation as orphan drug have been approved by the responsible committee of the orphan medicinal products of the EMA. Several studies, however, in the last decade have shown that the approval of orphan drugs by the EMA is frequently based on very low evidence as to efficacy and safety of these drugs. And therefore, it is not at all surprising that the added benefit assessment in Germany resulted in a not quantifiable added therapeutic benefit for most of these orphan drugs coming into the German market. Nevertheless, many of these drugs frequently for the indication on cancer have earned hundreds of millions in euro and in addition benefited from an extended duration of market exclusivity, not rarely more than 10 years. Therefore, there has been a growing concern both in the United States and in Europe that the orphan drug legislation has been subject to gaming. Furthermore, the hope linked with this legislation, namely to incentivize research and development by pharmaceutical companies in therapeutic areas that would otherwise be too unattractive, has not been fulfilled. Most important also in 2021, for more than 90%, 90% of rare diseases, there are no effective drugs in the market, especially for rare diseases that affect children. Therefore, I would like to conclude in view of this obvious misuse of the dolphin drug legislation during the last two decades in Europe, the time is ripe to thoroughly review the incentives granted by this legislation. And in this context, I would like to set priorities regarding the following five topics. First of all, the legislative requirements for the designation as orphan drug should be concretized. That means the definition of orphan diseases as well as the terms unmet medical need, significant benefit, and innovative medicine. Both the prevalence and profitability criteria have to be reviewed and adapted to the current requirements. Second, therefore, authorization of drugs for rare diseases should rely on post-marketing research to cover incomplete information as to safety and efficacy frequently evident at the time of approval. Thirdly, beyond that, we urgently need more transparency as to cost for research and development of orphan drugs for pharmaceutical companies as well, and this is very important, as well as public grants received for the design and development of these drugs. Fourth, affordability and availability of approved orphan drugs in all member states of the EU should be facilitated. And finally, last but not least, we need a high degree of transparency regarding the average revenues per year in order to assess whether orphan drugs still qualify for the granted incentives for example, market exclusivity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Volvider. This was a tour de force. You touched upon a lot of different topics. And I see Kaya Katorska taking down and uh, writing down notes. And the purpose of this webinar throughout the day today is to come up with concrete recommendations. Because, ladies and gentlemen, we are at this stage where we're looking at a possible review and a critical review of these two incredibly important pieces of legislation. But uh, to do so, we need to be operational and action oriented. Beata, what did they describe the situation from the HDA perspective, the proliferation of orphan uh, drugs in the market? What does it mean? Does it make your life harder or is it encouraging? What, what is it the HDA perspective on this topic? 
Um, yes, thank you very much. Um, really, to follow up on, on Wolf Dieter's description of the situation, I, I agree very much um, with his description. Um, we have been assessing um, all orphan drugs entering the German market since since 2011, and therefore I think we have a, a quite a, a good understanding of, of what's going on. Um, and what we see is indeed that there are areas in the in the orphan diseases field that have had a number of important um, developments, which is positive, I think. But again, there are other areas which don't see any improvement. And, um, and I feel that we have to reset incentives to come to a to a better distribution of where the um, research efforts should go. Um, at the same time, we have seen um, that for the available orphans, when they enter the market, we have insufficient evidence to understand what these drugs really mean for patients. So what is the benefit? What are possible harms? And how does this relate uh, indeed to the incentives that have been, have been given to, the, um, to, to these drugs? Um, we we indeed are not able to describe what these drugs mean for patients in 70% of the cases. And, and what does that mean? That means we can't kind of optimize quality of care. We don't know how to exactly use those drugs. And um, we also don't understand whether the incentives um, that continue to be given to these drugs um, are, are well put in place. So um, both these problems, the lack of, um, of treatments in wide areas of orphan diseases, we are still seeing, plus the, the fact that we don't have sufficient evidence to understand what these drugs mean for patients, means that we need more studies. Um, and to be able to do more studies, we, we should develop um, an infrastructure that allows for more easy to conduct and less costly studies, and maybe we can come to that later. Um, with regard to the to the regulation, um, I would would like to put forward three um, three suggestions. So first, um, first, we might want to discuss the option to include a process that um, results in an identification and specification of areas of most need. And it would be good if we could involve patients and physicians in this discussion, and then maybe um, couple the incentives and, um, and um, support development in these areas. Um, I, I absolutely agree with uh, Wolf Dieter's suggestion that we need to revise the um, criteria, specifically the criterion for significant benefit. Um, as far as I understand from the, um, from the study done uh, by, the, by the commission, um, the majority of drugs, uh, of orphan drugs, um, uses the significant benefit um, criterion to retain the orphan status. That means there are other drugs, other treatments available. And the significant benefit criterion is quite low a bar right now. So um, this certainly should be revised to really reward um, drugs that mean uh, really that lead to a real added benefit for patients. And the third thing, um, I think that we need to consider whether we should use incentives according to a one size fits all approach. Right now, the criterion mainly is the, the, the prevalence. And I think um, that is not helpful. Um, we might, we might be able to, uh, to use examples um, from, from reimbursement environments. For example, in Germany, um, there also is what we call an orphan privilege in the assessment and pricing negotiations. And actually, this is withdrawn at the moment the drug reaches a revenue of more than 50 million per year. So I'm wondering whether the, um, the, the structure of incentives for orphan drugs, which certainly we, which we certainly need, but whether the structure of incentives could be, um, could be more specific to the, to the situation. Thank you, Beata. Very concrete recommendations from your side as well. Uh, Ward, I, I know that within ECL, within the European Cancer Leagues, uh, you are concerned about the questions of um, 
the lack of affordability of those products because these products, uh, in spite of the perks and benefits that they, ben they enjoy from the legislation, they come onto the market with very high prices. And we also know that there is a problem with the availability of these products in many numerous EU member states. What are your thoughts on these, on these topics within ECL? Well, uh, first, well, what I like to stress is that um, many orphan drugs that came to the market since the regulation um, have been for a large share anti-cancer drugs. This, of course, for, for cancer patients with a rare tumor, this has been a, an important regulation. But at the same time, well, we see some challenges. Uh, as you rightly mentioned, there is this, this challenge of affordability and also an equal access in Europe. But um, what we also see as a challenge is that for many rare cancers, we still have very low uh, survival figures. So there is also um, a high unmet need there. And, and so we should also think about um, setting the incentives in the new of the revised regulation so that um, R&D uh, efforts are targeted to the, to the cancers with, with the high unmet need. So, um, but then when we come to the issue of, of affordability, um, first I, uh, idea I want to uh, put forward here is that this is also closely linked to um, data and evidence about uh, added benefit. Because if we have very good data about uh, added benefit, then uh, paying for a drug is more worthwhile. So we also think that it is important to invest in an infrastructure um, that leads to good uh, evidence about um, patient relevant outcome measures such as overall survival and quality of life and um, and there we, we think we should invest in independent clinical trials where um, academic groups play a very important role so if academic groups um, could have more control about uh, trial design, uh, also about uh, the, 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 the relevant endpoints and if the, the, the data that they uh, produce can be publicly owned. This can mean a real progress um, for to have better data about the, the added value of, of these drugs. Um, then, but when we come to, to unequal access in Europe and affordability, for us, that's of course, that's a very big concern because uh, orphan drugs are not uh, accessible in every, every European country. And we believe that um, high price play, plays an important role here. Um, the prices of the current generation of drugs are very high, but in the pipeline now, we, we have like gene therapies, cell therapies. Um, I think there are now um, around 130 cell and gene therapies in the pipeline targeting rare diseases. And price levels there are uh, several hundred thousands of euros or, or even 1 million euros. So there the, the issue of affordability is a real challenge. And this will also uh, exacerbate the problem of, of inequality in Europe. Um, and with ECL there, we, we have um, uh, launched the concept of fair price last year. And uh, according to ECL, um, a fair price is a price that is justifiable, predictable, and cost-effective within the aims and priorities of healthcare systems and the available budget. Um, and like this, if, it, if we look at the concept of just justifiable in this uh, definition, justifiable for us means that the price um, is in a reasonable relationship to the added value of a drug, but also to the R&D cost. And so we think that the Europe, European policy should, should focus on um, um, developing towards fair prices. And we think that this can lead to um, yeah, more, more affordability and also more, more access throughout Europe. And then when we link this to the regulation, then we think that maybe we should think about um, um, making uh, the incentives dependent on real access. For example, you could think about um, market exclusivity that is uh, of which the duration depends on uh, access throughout Europe. And we could also think about um, modulating market exclusivity to um, the return on investment. So if the return on investment is clearly sufficient, then um, the market exclusivity maybe could be shorter than 10 years. 
but of course then this, this also presupposes that there is more transparency about R&D costs and, and about other costs of, of firms. Word. If I may, I will interrupt you there and we will come back to these okay. uh, questions you touched upon and thank you for the very concrete suggestions as well. Kaya, from what I hear so far from uh, both Dieter Beata and Ward, there is a conundrum. There is a conundrum between weak evidence, and I hear that very clearly from all three previous uh, speakers, and high prices, excessive prices. So how do we, and I guess this conundrum of weak evidence and high prices is something that is on the radar also of the Commission and is driving this review. If you could tell us a bit, what are the next steps and what are the scenarios? And of course, we will come back to a bit, Ward already started talking about possible scenarios, but first, what are the next steps and what is driving the Commission in this exercise? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Yanis. Uh, thanks a lot for inviting me here. And I would like really to thank the previous speakers for your excellent comments. Of course, I am here more as a listener to your thoughts. And this just is an ongoing process, you know, since the evaluation, um, which concluded in, 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 uh, in, August, in August, then we had um, we published the inception um, impact assessment, which is the roadmap which describes now what are the options, what are we looking for in this review. Um, so I'm very happy to be here. Um, soon our consultations by the contractor will start. You have seen that we already started the open public consultation, um, which will run until end of July. Um, and soon really in the, in the few, let's say in the coming weeks, um, the targeted consultations as well, which will start in, in uh, form of service, but and as well interviews. And I am um, very happy to hear your comments uh, as all these aspects will be part of those consultations. Because what we have seen actually in this evaluation is exactly what you mentioned now. So we have the unmet need, uh, we have different kind of, of course, um, products, um, I would say that the level, um, this, this level of significant benefit, because this was the link that you mentioned, many products, we set for the significant benefit, the bar is set higher in, than in the other jurisdiction. This we see that this um, significant, and this as well was shown in the evaluation. But still we see that 70% of orphans on the market are those which had to show significant benefit, which means that Still, um, we have development in the areas where there are treatment options for patients, and we have this big unmet needs on 95% without treatment options. So we need to see, because the regulation in the form now uh, doesn't have, let's say, any, doesn't give any directions uh, to boost development in those areas of, of unmet needs. So this is one part which we'll be looking at. Uh, of course, there is this big as well um, gap in, in, in availability and access among member states. And this is as well something that we, um, that we see. And of course, we have seen in the evaluation that there are various factors which influence this, um, this unequal access. And uh, there is only that far that the regulation can go in, in addressing that. But on the other hand, the aim of the regulation has always been that patients with rare diseases have the same quality of, of, of treatment as any other patient. So we are trying now to look for, for solutions and ways if this we can try to improve access with the regulation. For example, like it was mentioned by, by you, um, to link the incentives with the obligation to, to place the product um, in a majority or all member states. So, this is one you could have seen that this is in, 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 in one of those options. You mentioned as well the development of science, uh, new technologies, which are may overwhelm the system. Of course, we see that this is of great benefit for patients uh, because we need to follow the scientific development and we need to catch up with the scientific development with the regulatory framework on one hand. On the other, of course, we, we need to see that the aim of this regulation is um, to foster development in rare diseases. So somehow we need to try now to find ways to make the regulation flexible for this development on one hand, but on the other, not to create, let's say, space for some artificial subsets of, of, of common diseases. Um, we have, we of course, uh, we, you, you see that one option as well that we will be looking at is 
uh, a change of the of the criteria of the orphan criteria. So we have now the prevalence, we have the insufficient return on investment, we have significant benefit. Uh, we will be looking, of course, in the experience with the significant benefit criterion, which is a very important, unique for the EU system criterion. We will look at what is the experience with that, as well with the implementation of the of our of our notice uh, and. Um, different aspects of that. Of course, prevalence, it will be as well looked at. Do we keep it at that level? Should it be, should it be changed? Should we have a, a, another criterion for rare cancers? Um, uh, and as well, the aspects of return on investment, which was mentioned by all the speakers, which is a very important criterion, which, however, was not used. The evaluation has shown that the experience with this criterion is quite uh, low. Uh, as well, we have not in the evaluation received the uh, information about the, the cost of development um, from the developers. So now you, you have seen in, the, in our roadmap that we would like to see ways uh, how to bring back this return on investment, but a bit later um, to see how it would work if we um, try to, let's say, give a shorter market exclusivity uh, in the beginning, and then um, the prolongation of those market exclusivity would depend uh, on the various aspects, like, like for example, um, access, availability of that product in member state, and um, return on investment, and of course, the prevalence criterion. Uh, and my last, uh, my last comment, which also maybe relates to, to the previous comments, what is on this one size fits all incentive. And this is something which also we have seen um, in the evaluation. Um, and this is something we are looking into now in this in the study on the impact assessment to see uh, how the incentive could be, um, let's say, um, in, in, relation, re, re, in relation to what kind of product um, we are looking at an innovative product, a well-established use product, and as well the criteria of unmet needs, which was mentioned by, by everyone. This is as well something we look at to try to find ways to maybe establish those criteria, which would be common, which could be in the legislation, for example, and uh, products addressing those criteria would merit some additional incentives and help at different stages of, um, of the development. So thank, thank you. you, Kaya. Thank you for shedding some light into the possible scenarios that you are brainstorming at this stage in the, at the Commission. Um, Beata, what do we do? We're getting to a point where we treat every disease almost as a rare disease. What, what is that challenge? Um, because I think you agree, and, and, and I will pose the same question also to Wolf Dieter. This is where science is taking us, isn't it? Uh, where we keep looking at um, subgroups of patients. So we cannot, we cannot deny this, can we? Um, no, you're right. I mean, in, in principle, we have always done that, try to describe patients group that, patient groups that need different treatment. And we just have new criteria now to use. We have genetic makeup and things like that. So we, we are going down that road. But that doesn't necessarily mean that each of these patient groups becomes a rare disease which needs incentives. Yeah. So um, if, for example, if we look at, at patient groups with a certain genetic marker, we might these patient groups in, find these patient groups in different uh, diseases, and then it's still a larger number of patients. So I think we we have to really um, take care that we that we don't use that um, that in that we don't um, shape the incentives just to this one number of patients and don't consider the, the overall situation. Um, and at the same time, that um, also leads us to, um, to, to the necessity to, to change maybe our, our drug development processes. So if patient groups become smaller, we might need different study designs like adaptive platform trials. We might need to, um, to go beyond development of individual drugs, but have a look at, um, at portfolios of drugs and, and, and um, test them in, in, in uh, connected platform trials. This at the same time means if we have less patients, we need to learn more from these data. So um, the data should be available and Ward has pointed that out. I think that would be very important. The data should be so that 
to make sure nobody drops dead right now. Um, maybe firstly, in, an, in a protected environment, two researchers and assessment agencies, the individual patient data, to learn the maximum out of this. Um, and and that this, these are just steps we need to go to, um, to reflect on, on the developments we are seeing on the scientific side. Thank you, Beata. And Wolf Dieter, I guess, and you said it also at the beginning, the concern is the paucity of the evidence. At the end of the day, we approve drugs, but we don't know how they work, who they work for, how they exactly they work, and they come at a very high price. Um, and I guess from the physician's perspective, that is indeed a big problem, but also for patients as well. It's not enough to simply have a number of approvals of, of new uh, medicines. Isn't that so? <clears throat> yes, Janis, you are right. But I think in general, I would like to emphasize that, as mentioned before, that most of the orphan diseases have no adequate treatment at the moment, more than 90%, 20 years after the orphan drug legislation came into force. And this is not... We cannot be happy about this. Of course, for me as a medical doctor in the field of cancer, it's nice to have new orphan drugs for cancer. But on the other hand, I'm questioning whether cancer drugs mainly based on biomarkers became small subsets of diseases are really the main goal of the orphan drug legislation. I think this is not the right goal, especially because these drugs are highly cost, have high costs and will be developed by the pharmaceutical companies definitely also without these incentives because they are very attractive for the industry. And therefore, I think we should go back. First of all, I did not understand really what significant benefit means by the European Commission. Significant benefit has to be defined and it's quite different from added therapeutic benefit as the term we use in Germany for the added benefit assessment. And if you look at these drugs, I, I'm pretty sure that most of these drugs in the field of cancer have no significant benefit shown at the time point of approval. And therefore post-marketing studies are extremely necessary and very important. And I think therefore this is a very, very important criteria on which we should better define in the near future, as well as mentioned before, the investment by the pharmaceutical companies and the revenues received, which are, as we all know, very, very high, especially in more than 50% of the orphan drugs developed for cancer. And therefore also the prevalence criteria have to be revised because I think they are not up to date in the area of personalized or precision medicines. Both terms I do not like, but they are used and now the approval is based on these criteria. And, and Kaya, if I may, the, the, the direction of the regulation also on your radar right now with all of the discussions that are happening, um, is it also to boost the competitiveness of the sector or is it mostly about drug development? Because I'm thinking also of what sort of changes can we see in Europe and there is a question also from the Q&A chat room in terms of what is happening also in the US, because obviously Europe is not isolated. So um, my question to you is, to what extent also the developments in other jurisdictions are on your radar or not for this, for this review? Thank you, Yanis, for this question. Of course, those developments are in, in our radar. We were looking at them as well when we were evaluating our EU system. And now as well, when, when we are checking what could be the best options for change, we are of course as well benchmarking with other Japanese US systems. That's, um, that's clear. And I saw the comment in the chat and it's very interesting. You know, in US, they also have a huge unmet uh, medical need. So this gap is not, it's not smaller, but of course the systems are very different. So we do not, um, if the orphan regulation does not allow subsetting um, for the moment, it is, very, it is very difficult for applicants to, um, to get a, de a designation for, for a subset. Of course, now in, with the, like we hear as well from World Theater with the personalized medicine, uh, which is now coming more um, 
we might see development in rare diseases, but also in the subset of non-rare diseases. And this is a difficult matter which will be looked at carefully now in the review, because it may not be only the matter of, of, of uh, decreasing uh, highly the prevalence, because it is, will be still very, very low for personalized medicine. So we need to look at various aspects. Um, and of course, we look at the US system. Um, for the moment, we give market exclusivity, which is 10 years, which is the highest in the world. Um, and you see that in these options now for review as well, we try to find ways to boost development in these areas of unmet needs. And there we want to test how to do that, what else maybe the developers need, especially SMEs, academia. So for us, it is as well important to help developers. So these consultations now in the review, it is very important to have to receive good feedback for everyone, because we are, this is the moment that we listen as well to, to everyone to see what do you need to, to, because there may be difficulties in development because the market is very slow or because there's just no science. So I think it is also important to highlight that the regulation is, 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 a, is a legal framework. It is, let's say, one part of this huge ecosystem on rare diseases. We have as well research, we have other activities under the big pharma strategy. So, so it should all basically interlink together and, and work well together. And this is what we, what we aim for in, in the EU. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I wanted to ask you um, if you can elaborate a bit, because it's a sensitive point and there is also a comment uh, by our viewers. Incentives linking or rewarding the industry with further incentives. There are a lot of people who say that the industry has had a lot of incentives, <laughs> um, giving them even more incentives in order to put their products on more markets simultaneously in Europe. To what extent is this a wise approach, especially when we see that at the end of the day, this is uh, just the result of commercial marketing and business strategies of companies. So why reward them even further, if I understood you correctly, that this is one of the scenarios that you are considering right now? Yes, of course. Um, you know, we have seen, of course, that, that uh, in the evaluation that the uh, 10-year market exclusivity, of course, is a very good reward um, and, 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 and companies, uh, use well and are happy with that reward. We see products, we see developments, but we still have this high unmet need. So the question we have to pose ourselves is that, is this not enough then? What else is needed to help those developments? So we try, you know, there are various options. Like I explained, we look at how to modulate incentives to the type of development, to the type of unmet needs addressed, uh, but as well, in the unmet need, what help can we give? What more is needed to really develop products and, and have products uh, accessible to patients who really need them? So, um, but on the other hand, we, we, we would like to look as well into ways, you know, how to have some kind of, let's say, control mechanism. So to see if this, if this market exclusivity needs to be long, it, it needs to be long enough and as well prolonged upon different uh, requirements. And one of them is, is as well in sufficient return on investment. So this relates to the Thank comments. you, Kaya. Well, yes, for me, honestly speaking, especially with the evergreening strategies and other strategies that we see employed by the companies, having a 30 year or a 30 year long period of exclusivity and monopoly for me, it's a public policy failure, but that's a different question because we need to discourage this kind of practices of profit maximization. We have a few minutes left. I want to come to Ward and Beate. Beate, you mentioned the question of clinical trials. Again, when it comes to the evidence generation, what would you like to see? And I think also Ward with ECL have views on that. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you. Um, actually, I, I would like to come, come back to Kaya's suggestion that we need more support for maybe smaller companies and academia um, in this area. And I think it would be most helpful if we could provide these smaller businesses and academia with an infrastructure to run their trials, to, to have less costly and more easy trials. And there is this European Health Data Space Initiative right now. There is the Darwin project. And I think we need to use these initiatives to ensure we have a European-wide trial infrastructure for easy trials that is even more important for orphan drugs because we obviously need to to collect the patients from all over Europe so if we could provide this infrastructure I feel that would be helpful 
Thank you. Very concrete recommendation. Word on this. Yeah. Well, I think, as I already said, um, I think we need to support groups like, like the existing European reference networks or the URTC so that they can do independent clinical trials. Um, next to that, um, we also have to gather uh, real-world data, real-world evidence. And when it comes to cancer, then the cancer registries can play a very important role in this. So we should reinforce uh, non-commercial research institutes li like uh, uh, URTC cancer registries. But I think we also have to think about uh, maybe uh, new ways of developing drugs and even new business models. Like, for example, we already have uh, DNDI in the Dutch and the Netherlands, we have the Fair Medicine Foundation, and they try to um, collaborate with the several stakeholders in a new way. Uh, so the patient groups and academics have a much stronger role in the research and development um, process in these initiatives. Uh, and they also are going to approach intellectual property in a new way. For example, they are going to use frameworks such as socially responsible licensing, which means that when something is developed in an academic environment and it is licensed to, uh, to an enterprise, then the licensing agreement also contains provisions about availability. And I think we also have to think about how the European Union can give incentives um, to, to new, new business models like that. Um, you could also think, for example, about the system, like, for example, when, it, when a company brings a drug to the market, then, it, for example, you could uh, think about giving that company a reward for the R&D, but that reward is conditional on the fact that it is um, bringing the drug to the market in every European country uh, at the cost of production and distribution. So these, uh, these are maybe a bit more radical, but they would bring drugs to the patient in the whole of Europe at an affordable price. So I think it is worth uh, exploring this and starting experiments with ideas like that. Thank you. Thank you, Ward. And I think this is the time. Kaya, I know you already have some ideas within the Commission, but I invite you to be open also to new ideas, additional ideas uh, and scenarios. Uh, I think this is the time for all of us to reflect. And I, I love that I see a lot of engagement from our uh, viewers in the Q&A chat room. I like the idea of the carrot and stick. I don't think that anyone is against science or the industry uh, per se. It's on the contrary, having a, a new balance and making sure that the incentives, these privileges that are granted by, very generously, if I may add, by the legislators are used appropriately and not overused, misused or abused, because at the end of the day, if that's the case, then we are all um, uh, losing, maybe with the exception of, of uh, industry's uh, profits. Thank you very much. Beata Wiesler from me, Quick, Wolf Dieter Ludwig from the German Medical Commission, Kaya Katorska from the European Commission, Digi Santé, and Ward Rommel from ECL and the, and the Flemish um, uh, uh, Cancer League. Thank you for your time. You are more than welcome to stay online. We need to change, um, although there are, there is an overlap. Uh, there is certainly overlaps. Um, we are moving on to the second panel. There is no coffee break, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I would like to welcome uh, the, the second panel is on a topic that we don't hear so much about in Brussels, and this is why I'm delighted to be joined today by Professor Gilles Vassal uh, from the European Society for Pediatric Oncology, IOP Europe. He's one of the gurus, if not the guru, uh, he's a pediatric oncologist uh, in Europe. Um, former president of Siopi Europe. Uh, Siopi, I invite you to, to check the um, uh, organization out. It's a, it's a fantastic network. I'm delighted particularly to have Delphine Inen um, with us today. Uh, she is um, a parent of, uh, of a cancer survivor. Of, uh, of her, her son uh, is, has struggled with cancer in the past. I think he's now doing well. Um, Delphine, is with CCI Europe, uh, Childhood Cancer International, the European, the regional uh, committee. And this is a, a fantastic network of uh, uh, patient support, bringing together uh, survivors, but also their, their parents. And, and, and I'm very uh, excited to hear uh, Delphine's perspective in this discussion. And please uh, go and visit the site of her other organizations. She is the kicker in chief of Kick Cancer, which is a Belgian foundation, uh, and they do fantastic work. Please, I invite you to uh, visit their website. Frank Hulstart um, from the Belgian uh, HDA agency, KCE. And of course, last but not least, Fabio Datri, a colleague of Kaya Gadorska from Santé, working on the file of the pediatrics regulation. Professor Vassal, Gilles, 
Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I hope you enjoyed also part of the first discussion. There are similarities, but I want you to explain to us what was the situation in pediatric cancers uh, before the introduction of the uh, regulation? Also from your perspective as a pediatric oncologist and what have you seen change in the past 10, 15 years? So thank you, Yanis. And thank you for calling me guru, which for the first time in my life, I have been told that I would be a guru. Um, to your point, cancer is a rare disease in children but each year 35,000 young people are diagnosed with cancer. Over the last 50 years, major progress has been made by academia through clinical research without most of the time any support from the pharmaceutical company using the medicine in the pharmacy. And the, and the cure rate is now 80%, which is excellent. And the question is the quality of cure. But 6,000 young people each year die of cancer still, the first cause of death by disease. And this is why we need, we need innovative treatment for this patient. And you ask me what happened before the regulation was in. Well, we were trying to get access to the new drugs to develop them in patients. But then the company said, well, you know, it's, it, it's risky. Wait until we do have a drug for adults. So it was really difficult to have access to innovation for these patients suffering of non-curable diseases. And this is why our hope in the regulation was really great and we contributed. And we say, hey, the same drugs are being used in adults and children. So consider that the one coming up should be evaluated as well in children as in adults based on the biology. So since 2007, the regulation is up and running and it is a success, a clear success in many, many disease um, pediatric specialty, rheumatology, infectious disease, where the disease is the same in adults and children. But the problem in pediatric oncology is that we do have different cancers, completely different cancer. No breast, no lung, no colorectal cancer, no prostate cancer in children, but leukemias, lymphoma, brain tumors, neuroblastoma. So the cancer are different, but 80% of the drug we use in children are used in adults. And this is one of the major uh, loophole or issue in the current regulation that because a lung cancer does not exist in children, a drug developed because it's targeted in lung cancer was not developed by a company in, in pediatric malignancy with the same target. So this is why we say this regulation was really, really extremely important in the field of pediatrics, really putting pediatrics in the activities on the shelves, on the table for the pharmaceutical company. But at the time, it really not really address the needs of children with cancer. And the same for neonatology. So clearly we hope that the changes in the regulation coming up will better address those needs, accelerate innovation, not losing time waiting to start clinical trials to be sure that children will have access to innovative treatment. So Gilles, just to, just to ask you, develop for children. Sorry, yeah. Just to ask you on this, when you say accelerate innovation and start clinical trials, if you can explain to us what is the problem? Why are clinical trials not launched? If you can make so, it even clearer. Thank oh, you. oh, sure, absolutely. Uh, this is in pediatric oncology, but this is also in other fields. Um, the, the a company develop uh, uh, an asset in adults, but the start of the pediatric trials is after the drug is approved in adults. While we say it should be in parallel. So starting earlier, the evaluation in children of the compound which is relevant in order to be able to generate sufficient information at the time of the marketing authorization, we will have information for children. And then pediatric oncologists and other pediatricians will not have to use off-label medicine, which is the case at the moment. The clinical trials in children start late after first approval in adults. So the drug is being used off label and we have difficulty recruiting patients into the trial. So this is why we need to accelerate. Think early. When a company develops a drug, is it relevant or not based on science for pediatric malignancies? And if it is, as soon as we have enough, enough data, start the evaluation in children. 
So we will save time. We will focus on the right drug to develop. And then we will have more rapidly uh, innovative treatment to cure more children. Jill, excellent. Thank you very much because you made it crystal clear. And I want, I want our audience to understand exactly what the situation is and the state of play. Delphine, Delphine Inen from CCI Europe and Key Cancer Foundation. What was your experience? Also, bring it a bit home to us, what, what Gilles described now, and what are the dilemmas and the challenges from the parents' perspective, especially given the, the uncertainties uh, and the severe effects, the adverse effects of these treatments, and the questions of the, the choices that need to be made from the parent for uh, a kid with uh, cancer. And thank you for joining us, Delphine. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about the specific situation of children with cancer. And actually, your question is very broad, so I'm going to try to structure my answer. First of all, um, when your child is diagnosed with cancer, people around you always tell you, don't worry, there's so much research, so much uh, innovation going on, it's going to be okay. And actually, when my son was diagnosed in 2013, I believe those words because I did my job as a parent, make sure that he was being treated in the best facilities in Belgium where he could, that he was accessing the gold standard of treatment, which he did. But what I didn't know, and I had no idea that every single drug in the cocktail or, you know, like the, the, the protocol he was following was older than myself. And I didn't know either that all these drugs were being used off label. Um, and so it's only when he relapsed a couple of years later um, that he was offered, again, off-label drugs, not older than me, but much older than him. The drugs were about 20 years old at that time. Um, it's only then that I realized that they were old and off-label because some of those drugs in the end were not reimbursed, which causes a, a accessibility issue. And it's actually at that point um, that the issue of innovation for young patients actually struck me as a real thing because before that I had no idea. And the funny, if I may say funny thing is that no one knows. When I was telling my friends, oh, do, do you actually know that there are no clinical trials for Rafael? His chances of survival at the time of his relapse were actually pretty low. Um, so it felt like it was my job again to understand what the standard protocol was, but also prepare for the possibility that it wouldn't work. And I wanted to know where could we go if things go wrong? Where are there trials open? And the answer was nothing, nowhere. Because I looked into other countries and there was actually nothing going on for abdominosarcoma at the time. And the sad truth is there isn't so much more specifically going on for abdominosarcoma. So it's still an issue. And it's something that is very striking for parents and young patients to understand that they are being forgotten. Um, now my son is doing well, he's, it's quite a miracle. He's not off the hook yet. We haven't, um, there hasn't been sufficient time since his remission. Um, but the treatment he went through was extremely toxic. Um, he's being monitored for many potential side effects. But also, um, in order to put it in complete remission, we had to make some difficult decisions like amputation, which sh sheds the light to some of the um, um, major issue, even though we have reached the incredible level of 80% um, cure rate, which is a great success, and we owe it to academia mostly. Um, two thirds of young patients in remission um, will suffer long-term side effect caused by their treatment. They receive their drugs when they are in growth, a sensitive period of a lifetime where your organs still develop. Um, and so many children will have to deal with either side effect caused by surgery like amputation, but also kidney issues or um, endocrinal issues. And so those patients need to be tightly follow up, which is a cost to society as well. Um, because we want to make sure that they have a good quality of life when they survive. And this, the mere fact that the current re treatments for children are so toxic has also a psychological effect and impact on them, because some of them will suffer from post-traumatic stress syndromes. And so we really need, first of all, also, I, I, I want to stress one fact, 80% cure rate is an incredible success. And some people will conclude, why do we need to do more for children? But it's, it's a number and it's an average. If we de-average that and look at actual 
um, specific types of pediatric tumors, we see that some of them will not benefit from such high chances. Many of them are still high risk with less than 50% cure rate. And it's also due to the fact that many uh, pediatric cancers are diagnosed when they are already metastatic partly because they develop extremely rapidly, and so it's hard to follow the race of cancer. Um, and metastatic cancer, as we all know, are more difficult to cure. So we need better drugs, better treatments in general for um, those children with a low cure rate today. But we also need better drugs for those who do get in remission today because we need to um, then reduce the long-term side effects and improve the quality of life. Thank you, Delphine. Gilles, you, I want to challenge you a bit. I want you to explain to us, you keep saying we need to move from um, a, a drug-centric model to a patient-centric model. What does this mean? We have here uh, Fabio Datri from the commission. What would you like him to understand when you say that? And how do we translate that into policy? Well, Yanis, uh, uh, I think that I, nothing I, I would like today to make Fabio understand because we are working a lot together. And he knows much of the thing I will say. And clearly the work with the commission on really improving regulation is really something that we are looking for. Um, the point is that um, the, uh, um, the, 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 the drug development that I call drug centric so far was there is a drug developed in adults. Is the disease the same in children? If yes, develop in children. Patient centric is what are the needs for these patients in the relapse in a given disease and what is the biology we know about this patient to really make the choice of the best drug to develop because we have a paradox if you look at how many new compounds are being developed in adults there are hundreds and hundreds of new treatments and this is clearly a change in drug development in oncology many new treatments for adults and many more in development we cannot develop all these compounds in children so we need to have a way to prioritize the best drug based on the science, understanding the disease to match the alteration and increase the likelihood of the drug being, approved, being efficient, but also the needs of the patient. Some patients have a 95% cure rate. The need for new treatment is completely different from those patients such as with the brain tumors with a median survival of only nine months. So, this is why the change that is foreseen in the change in regulation, and I guess Fabio will address this, is that let's look at the unmet needs and the science to drive the development, prioritize compound, in a work together, and maybe we will address the issue of multi stakeholder which is absolutely essential in the field. But this is why I say, let's move from drug-centric, what do I do with drug? to patient-centric and science-driven development. Where are the needs and what are the drugs that will meet the needs? Thank you, Gilles. And speaking of multi-stakeholder platforms, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I invite you to uh, check out the work of Accelerate. There is also a fantastic webinar uh, with uh, Gilles Bassal where he explains all of the different regulatory steps. And I asked my colleagues if they can share it also in the chat room so that people can uh, watch that, which I find, I found, uh, and Gilles, it's fantastic that you did it because it's so informative and clear. Um, Fabio, based on what you've heard, what are the thoughts uh, with the commission right now? Uh, what are the next steps and what kind of uh, feedback are you looking to get from stakeholders like us? I cannot hear you, Fabri Fabio. I Sorry, I, I was double muted, so now you should be able to, to hear me. Um, no, I was saying Gilles Delphine has been very, very clear. Uh, the, the regulation has worked quite well, I would think, say that has been a success, but in general, when uh, you have a drug that is developed for adults and you have the same, exactly the same problem in Chile, in that case, has worked very well. Uh, the case that Gilles was describing and the team were describing, where you have drugs developed for a cancer in adult, but you have a different cancer in children. Now the regulations say you don't have the obligation to study in children. I mean, not the obligation. Companies could have decided voluntarily. It's not that it's forbidden, but we see that this is not happening. So we are reflecting on change, and, and this is ongoing internationally. In the US, we, we see the same changing happening. So to have introduced novel obligations, so to take into consideration the how 
the, the molecules in under development works, the, the mechanism of action of the molecules, and to see if it can work also on a different disease, on a different type of cancer in children, and have companies oblig the obligation to study earlier. As Gilles said, I mean, what is key is to have an early clinical trial in Chile, not to wait that uh, the product is developed and marketed for adults and then start the pediatric development. So uh, this is something we are reflecting on. Uh, uh, but the other are, the, as Gilles was saying, a lot of other unmet needs. And we have to think about what are the therapeutic unmet needs of children. Um, and uh, we, we are reflecting how to best uh, help also companies and patients and civil society to reflect on which area uh, there should be more clinical research and where medicine should be developed. Uh, so to change a little bit, uh, Gilles has explained very well, and as you said in Accelerate, uh, there is this uh, very, very good explanation. The, the model today is to think about adult. Adult is a huge population, and so to think about a disease in adult and develop drugs there, and then to see if they can be used in children. Now, but there are areas where you, you, the needs are different. So you have the neonatology, but you have also uh, uh, neodever, neodevelopmental uh, diseases in, in children and adolescents where you have very, very few development and the needs are very, you cannot use the, the, the adult drugs. So to see how we can help, even help companies with new model and involving uh, the, the civil society and the patient to identify, but also creating uh, I know that, Yanis, you don't like that there were novel incentives and novel tools, but what we have today, I don't think that is adapted to all development. What we have today is adapted to a development where you have an adult pipeline ongoing, but we have to think where there is no adult pipeline. Uh, what we have seen in the evaluation is the current tools are not so good in helping the development. So to, to start a reflection and having maybe something new that could help uh, to have a uh, novel medicine for this area of uh, therapeutic and med needs uh, for children uh, developed. And, and then, I mean, the, the discussion is, is even more complex as Gilles was saying, uh, we cannot afford to have 10 compounds developed at the same time in the same area. Children is a small population, so there should be some sort of uh, prioritization. I don't know if this can be done in the legislation to be sincere with you, or it's better that it's done with a, a reflection from a scientific point of view in some sort of fora where there could be a confrontation and uh, um, a sort of discussion between patients, scientists, academics, and industry. Uh, I'm a bit afraid that this is something corollary to the regulation, uh, otherwise we could enter into, uh, uh, I mean, uh, complex procedure, but uh, uh, we are looking at all the, uh, these aspects, and as Kaya was saying, we, we are entering the, the, the open public consultation is open, uh, is open until end of July, if July. I'm not wrong, and uh, uh, there will be what is also important, there will be targeted consultation and interviews, so all that will be, all of you uh, will be probably co uh, consulted in the in the coming months, uh, and it will be very important to be very uh, detailed and very uh, think about the legislation. So think precisely what we want to have seen the legislation and how we want to see. Uh, the, the the moment of big statement is over. So now we are revising. So. Uh, we need to be very, very precise on what we want and the way that we want to ameliorate and to have uh, more and better medicine for, for our children. Thank you. Thank you, Fabio. Thank you for your openness. And it's good that you remind us that you, we need to do our homework. I know that uh, SIOPI and CCI, they've been doing their homework and it's fantastic that you work together. Yeah. Frank Hirstart, um, thank you for your patience. Based on, on this exact last point made by Fabio, on the question of the definition of unmet needs and, and the prioritization as well, from the HTA perspective, what are your thoughts? I know that this is a topic that is close to your heart. Yes, uh, thank you, Yanis. Uh, um, I, I wanted to make a few comments. First of all, that uh, indeed for health technology assessment, the, uh, this is always competitive, uh, always competitive versus uh, what is available, usual care, um, patient relevant outcomes, and also, of course, the, the routine patient population uh, being considered. 
Now on this uh, prioritization, um, actually today is the International Clinical Trials Day. And uh, this day, and we have this uh, symposium by ECRAN uh, running, in fact, uh, where platform trials are being discussed. And um, well, because of the pandemic, uh, this has also seen some acceleration. And perhaps if we indeed have the, the luxury of having multiple molecules for a specific disease uh, going into development, such a platform trial uh, running already in, um, in the pre-market phase um, would definitely be an option that should be considered as also Beata already alluded to in the orphan drug session. So that is um, uh, definitely an, an option in addition, of course, to, to registries that uh, would also be needed because, because of this uh, subgroups defined by biomarkers, what is often missing is the natural history of the disease in the specific uh, subgroup of patients that have that biomarker. So, um, and perhaps there we should think even of like a, a horizon scanning for um, biomarkers. And as soon as they um, define uh, a potential target for a drug, uh, registries need to include these markers and so that we have indeed information about the natural history because that is critical definitely for rare tumors and, and rare diseases. Um, so these are a, a few points, but uh, I think the important point about this uh, COVID is that these platform trials at least now are being discussed in collaboration with the regulators, with the European Medicines Agency, and that is very important also to extend to other areas, I think. Over. Absolutely, thank you. Um, Gilles, are you afraid that we may end up with a weaker regulation? Oh, no. Oh, no. What Not would that look right. like? What it would that look like? Well, you know that the FDA changed the regulation uh, uh, three years ago, and it's now up and running uh, since August. And they have a brand new thing, which is in oncology, a company should look at the target of the disease and not the disease in adults, yeah. come to the FDA and say, we would like to develop. This is a major change. And this is why it's important that the regulation embrace this change, which will resolve the issue, same compound, different diseases. But this is not the only issue. Eh? Start early is important. And I would like to uh, comment a little more on Frank's comment. We need to have the health technology assessment much early in the design on, of all these drug development in children with cancer and probably the others. Second, the randomized trial, we do randomized trial in pediatric oncology, but there are clear situations that we cannot run randomized trial because the disease is extremely rare with the target. And this is something in terms of new design of single arm trial with good historical data that should serve the evidence for the S technology assessment which I would say at the moment, as mentioned by, by Frank, is really generated evidence through comparative trial in all situations. In some situations in children with cancer, it cannot be done, but this is not a reason not to reimburse drugs in children. And finally, the platform trial, I fully agree with Frank. And the point is that we are running over the last three years, we have several platform trials in pediatric oncology for the early evaluation in uh, uh, different disease driven by the molecular uh, profiling of the patient, in neuroblastoma, in brain tumors. So we are running this platform trial front and this is really accelerating. But this is a topic different from prioritization. Prioritization is among all these drugs, which one should go there? Platform trial is a way to accelerate innovation and enlarge the option for a given patient. But prioritization is the complex things is among all the drugs developed in, children, in adults or by companies, which one should be developed in children? The issue of me too, number two, number three, number four in a class of, of compounds. So this is where this prioritization needs to be set up. And Fabio said, well, it's difficult to put prioritization in the, in the regulation, which is absolutely obvious because no one will tell the company, well, you go and a company, you don't go. But then what we developed over the last five years is that Let's work together. 
academia, industry, parents and patients, and regulators. And look at a disease, look at a class of compound, share the information, and then it become obvious that we cannot develop 10 uh, IL-1, 2, 3 inhibitors for a given disease. So we facilitate prioritization, and it works. It works in pediatric oncology, can work outside of pediatric oncology. So to your question, am I, am I afraid that there will no change? The answer is no, it cannot be. Because we deserve the patient to accelerate innovation for them, to cure more children, to cure them better, and to tackle inequality across Europe, which is an important objective, not for the regulation, but for the European Between Cancer Plan. Delphine, what are your concerns over companies' practices? We, we touched upon it also by Gilles, by Frank, what are your concerns from the, and also if you could explain to us, because I don't think that people understand, what is the contribution of um, parent associations to, for instance, the design of clinical trials? Thank you, Delphine. Thank you for your question. Well, it's actually pretty much similar to what patients do in other uh, disease areas. We look at the clinical trial design, we assess its feasibility, its uh, practicability for a young patient, um, we also advocate a lot the fact that young patients want to be protected with good research and not protected from research, which is something we often hear when we talk about clinical trials in children. People really jump on words like guinea pigs, while our, <clears throat> our impression is rather uh, that pharma companies don't want to open the clinical trial in children because they don't want to jeopardize their asset for adults if something went wrong with children. But there companies, is... Delphine, can I ask you, uh, are companies right in saying that it's difficult to recruit um, uh, uh, patients for, client, uh, for clinical trials or not? What is your well, response to that? Unfortunately, it is true. Um, it is true because as we, if you put all the aspects together, pediatric cancer are rare diseases, 80% um, cure rate, which means that a clinical trial will only be aimed at the 20 remaining percent. Every type of childhood cancer is a rare cancer. You have 35,000 patients a year, but it's 60 different subtypes of cancer. So recruitment is hard, definitely. And that's why it's important to define which drugs we want to test in children. And we really don't want to lose opportunity by testing every single new oncology drug in children because it wouldn't work, which is why the collaboration needs to be put in place at a very um, you know, grassroots level in, in, in the field of pediatric oncology. Now, I must say that one of my fear is, to be honest, I am quite confident the pediatric medicines regulation will be amended. We, we have to do it. It's happening in the States. It would, be, it, it, it would be enormous if we didn't do it in Europe. It would be a catastrophe. My fear is also, um, there are some clinical trials going on in adult oncology with new drugs. And sometimes we get a chance to have a first, a phase one clinical trial in children. Sometimes we only have preclinical data by those drugs. But there are uh, signs that th those drugs and the mechanism of action of those drugs could be relevant to children. But for some reason, it could be a strategic reason like lack of profitability or lack of efficacy in adults. The development is stopped in adults. And that's what we call the shelf drugs. And we have a, it's, 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 yeah, we can only say it's almost impossible to actually get those drugs back on track for children only if we are interested in developing them. They're called the shell drugs and it's caused by many different issues. Most companies are more on the lookout to buy new drugs rather than sell shelved assets. Um, the, um, and so we really do not succeed in, in getting access to those drugs and they're not very attractive to develop because they are children only drugs. So we really need to think about a framework. How can we make it attractive for pharma companies to sell those compounds to people who would be willing to actually develop them for children only? And how can we incentivize specifically, and then I'm uh, bouncing on what Fabio Datri said earlier, what kind of incentives could we specifically put in place for pediatric only indications 
because we need to make sure that that can happen too. pediatric only indications, because some pediatric cancer will only be cured if we look specifically, specifically into their biomarkers and their targets, and not only the adult one that could be transposed in children. So very, very clear, and thank you. Just, I want to make sure that everyone understands in terms of the recruitment of, of, uh, for clinical trials, your answer is that it is possible and it is desirable at the same time, feasible and desirable. Yes, um, well, to make it possible, we need one, a good strategy on which compound we're going to test in which disease, mm -hmm. because if we have too many clinical trials for one single disease simultaneously, clinical trials will compete for patients and no one will succeed and everyone will fail. And two, we also need, but that's another regulation, it's not the topic of the day, but we really need um, a good implementation of the regulation on clinical trials where the authorization of one clinical trial in one country can be expanded in all countries it, and that it's, you know, make sure that it's centralized so that um, all countries can open simultaneously because in rare population, if you miss the participation of Germany, which is a huge patient pool, you, you really miss an opportunity to have good data and uh, sufficient recruitment. Thank you, Delphine. And we have a comment, and Zil, I'll come to you. We have a comment also by Carmelo Rizzaris, IOP president-elect. He's saying that we should also aim to break the 13 years old dogma and allow the lessons to get into adult trials. So in relation to what we were just talking about. Zil, over to you. Yeah, and, and Carmelo really is absolutely right mentioning this, including adult, uh, adolescent in adult trial when it is scientifically and medically relevant. This is a program run by Accelerate, and now we give a stamp, fair trial, fostering age-inclusive research to clinical trial run by an uh, like industry sponsor or academia that fulfill these needs of adolescents. I wanted just to make a comment on clinical trials. We have been doing clinical trial for the last 50 years, which means that we know and we can recruit patients in clinical trials. Um, we are waiting since 2014 for the implementation of the clinical trial regulation that we have been told it will be at the end of this year. Really great, because we hope that this will facilitate the transnational implementation of our trial, because we don't do much national trial. These are rare disease. So we do pan-European trials. And you know what? We even do global trials, working with our colleagues in the US. And now in Accelerate, we say, we will need more of this global trial. We need to understand what are the others. And at the moment, we are surveying some of these trials to understand what are the others to facilitate the implementation of global trials. Because if we do so, we will have more patients participating and more rapidly implementation of clinical trials. So it's difficult, but it can be achieved. We have a track record of New England Journal of Paper with randomized trial run with the US really showing that we can deliver good clinical research. We need a favorable environment. We need a good pediatric regulation to facilitate access to the right drug and to make them develop. And a good regulatory environment for the clinical trial to facilitate the implementation of our trial. And, and Frank and Jill, um, a question on drug repurposing and then the, the need perhaps for clinicians. Jill, I want to challenge you a bit to be a bit more entrepreneurial when it comes to leading clinical trials. And perhaps there can be also public funding for these clinical trials. No, or I mean, we see also at the EMA, we, we offer scientific advice for free on this. Please, Jill, I see that you, and then Frank, uh, just one addition because we're coming to the end of the session, please. Oh, Yanis, I'm telling you that it's been 15 years that the pediatric oncologists with our colleagues have been running clinical trial. I can tell you in the field of pediatric oncology, many pediatric oncologists know well clinical trials and we are running where I, I don't have exact numbers, but we have hundreds, more than hundred trials ongoing in Europe for, for pediatric oncology. So clearly they are keen. And you say, let's be more entrepreneurial. Well, it is not in our blood to build companies. No. But clearly this is where the work together is so important. And you tell me that I am a guru. I'm not a guru. I'm just trying to pass messages. And the message is let's work together. When a company wants to develop a pediatric drug, 
a pediatric oncology drug before going to a, to a regulatory should work with the academia because it will build good plan, good clinical trial that are more likely to recruit patients. So this work together is essential. No one has the clue. The only way is all together, we can really make this happen with the right drugs earlier and improving the way we give access to innovation for children. And I guess we need more public funding. I think we all agree, public investment in this area. And we uh, hope a lot for, of the results, yes. Well, we are waiting for the cancer mission. We are waiting for the European for Health. We are waiting for the others. And you know, I, I am the one who said we should not put everything on the shoulder of the pharmaceutical company. They should be, in, they should be committed, they should be involved, but we need also some public funding because there are questions that companies will never address. The strategy, therapeutic strategy that is needed. This is academic research. So it, there is no blame, no shame. There is no one culprit and so on. Work together because this is the only way we can really um, achieve what I said. Better drug, the right ones, and earlier. Frank, uh, concluding remarks, because I think yes. we need to wrap up, please. If, if, if I may add, indeed, um, for repurposing for very cheap drugs, often important also in pediatrics, uh, um, the, the regulatory pathway needs to be further developed such that uh, non-commercial clinical trials can also lead to uh, a label change, in fact. And so I know this process is underway, but it needs to be stimulated and accelerated, probably. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Fabio, last concluding remarks, if anything to add. Just very quick, hyper quickly. So HT, involvement of HT bodies, I, I see it coming because with the new HTA regulation, if it will be adopted, there will be early interaction of HTA bodies uh, early. So the, the, their needs will be listened. On clinical trial, I'm, I'm very passionate because that was my previous dossier, the clinical trial regulation, and is coming. Uh, I think it's a very good regulation and can really complement the pediatric regulation because we will have a uniform, at least uh, assessment of clinical trial over Europe, involvement of pediatrician in the assessment and uh, better involvement of also the children. The children that participate in the trial will have to say and will be explained what is happening. So that they will uh, have a say. So I think we have, and then uh, we have all these instruments speaking about financing, uh, EU for Health and the cancer mission, cancer plan. So I think we, we are getting into a moment where we were discussing with Gilles the other day, where there are several initiatives that are coming uh, either in place or are developing that will really change uh, the uh, development of uh, medicine for children in the coming 10, 20 years, I hope. Uh, so thank yeah, you for really a moment. Thank you. Yes, a convergence, a convergence of powers, I would say, in different elements. And Delphine, final words and then over to Gilles. Yes, I, I just wanted to add, um, I think it's very important that we have the Horizon Europe and those kind of financing for projects. But we all know that research cannot only work by project. We need clear financing of structures so, so that we can hire people, develop a talent pool, so that we generate more ideas for projects. And that's something where pediatric oncology needs support. And I'm sure that many pediatric diseases need um, similar support. And so I know this is not, not the topic, but the European Reference Network, pediatric uh, cancers, they need to be properly funded. Um, the collaborative groups in Europe need to be properly funded so that we can generate more ideas for projects. Wonderful. Today, we rely a lot on extra night hours from pediatric oncologists and researchers, and we are very grateful for that, but that's how it should work. And Gilles Vassal, over to you for some concluding remarks. Yeah, I think we shared with the audience that we need really a better pediatric regulation, and I will not summarize this. But I want to tell you that we need also a better orphan drug regulation because it's a paradox. Cancer in children is rare and was not at all served by the orphan drug regulation that was up and running since 2001. And we have several, uh, several causes and reasons. So we need really, especially for the development of a specific pediatric drug. Because we will have on one hand, the drugs in adults that will be properly developed in children, but we will also 
the new knowledge coming from the researchers that will identify specific pediatric targets. And we do know some specific pediatric target, not easy to drug. And we will need to have incentive to really have startup and company developing this specific pediatric drug that could be first approved in children. So to your question, do we have hope? The answer is yes. We need both a good pediatric regulation addressing the needs, a good often regulation, I, I'm not alluding the issue of accessibility and cost, in an environment that working together, we can really move the needle, which is exactly what we need for children and adolescent system. Thank you, Gilles, and thank you for making the link with the orphan uh, regulation. But I'm very happy that for the purpose of this panel, we really zoomed in on the needs of uh, the pediatric regulation. As I said, we don't hear so much about, or as much as we hear about orphans in Brussels. So I think um, Delphine Inen um, of CCI Europe and the Kick Cancer Foundation, thank you for joining us. Frank Hustert okay. from the Belgian HDAKC, thank you for being with us. Fabio Datri from the Commission. Uh, Fabio, I think you have a lot of work to do and we are there to help you. And of course, uh, Professor Gilles Bassal um, from Gustave Roussy, thank you so much for your time. I think it was a highly informative discussion. Um, from my end, and I hand over um, to Olga Gozaeva of uh, SIOPI and also Ingrid Ross from the Norwegian Cancer Society. On behalf of the European Public Health Alliance, thank you for tuning in. I believe it was a, a very rich and very concrete action-oriented discussion. Of course, this is only the beginning of the journey. There is the um, survey. The deadline is uh, the survey of the Commission, July 30th. So make sure that you submit your um, input. Uh, stay with us uh, for a few more minutes for some concluding remarks by Ingrid. Ingrid, over to you and then over to Olga Kruzaev of Sayopi. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Yanis. Uh, it is my pleasure to provide the, this policy dialogue with some concluding remarks. And I have listened very carefully to all the panelists and I will wrap up uh, the orphan regulation and Olga from the European Society of Pediatric uh, Oncology will present takeaways regarding the pediatric, uh, pediatric regulation. So first, my compliments and gratitude for the excellent speakers we have had today on both panels. I really hear a genuine commitment to make change that will cause better treatment for children and people affected by rare diseases. So today, I also think we have managed not to limit the discussion to what didn't work in the past, but take uh, the discussion forward and discuss different ideas and scenarios to better this regulation and make it future proof. So I will not try to summarize all the points made, of course, but highlight a few hot issues that we need to address. Uh, so, and, and I think I will try to uh, group these in four key points. So first, there seem to be a common understanding on the fact that there are no approved treatments for 95% of rare diseases, and this must change. Wolf Dieter highlighted this in an excellent way. He said, we don't have sufficient evidence for the use of some medicines, and we need more studies. And keep in mind, everyone, that uh, the genetics are taking us into a future where more, although not all, patient groups will be rare. Second, I hear a big push towards more transparency. Most of the panelists under, underline that we need a high degree of transparency, not only in costs and R&D, but in a broad sense. I hear a clear voice asking to increase transparency to better understand the pharmaceutical system. And tapping into what my colleague Guy mentioned uh, in the start, the aim of the regulation has always been that patients with rare diseases have the same access to good treatment. And that is also why uh, we in the cancer societies engage in the European Fair Pricing Networks. Uh, access to cancer medicines is a problem, availability is a problem, and an important factor are the extreme high prices of some medicines. And we are afraid that if we don't act towards transparency now, the sustainability of the health systems will be threatened. And third, I heard linking incentives of reward to access to medicine. I heard this phrased as, the need for a new balance. I heard Kaya talk about incentives worth incentivizing, and she explained that the goal of the directive is to ensure a sustainable ecosystem for orphan medical products that creates innovations that reach patient, patients. So both goals can be reached if they are, or when they are linked. Uh, incentives on the one hand in light of the product and access availability and affordability on the other hand. And fourth, I heard incentives to academia. 
uh, that was the point that was made by many, but also Dr. Ward Romo from the ECL to ensure that academia plays a bigger role in the ecosystem of the orphan medical products creation. Investing in academical clinical trials, cancer registries, and so on. A lot of in innovations emanate from academia in a non-commercial uh, setting. So assisting academia when possible and where possible should be a key target. So, and last, this event also proved to me the importance that we as civil society work together towards common important goals. So thank you everyone. And uh, I will give the word to Olga. Thank you very much, uh, Ingrid, and uh, thank you very much again to the panelists. Uh, um, it's a real pleasure for SIOP Europe, the European Society of Pediatric Oncology, to co-organize these uh, very important discussions with our colleagues from uh, uh, IFA, ECL, and EFPN. Um, so it is uh, now my pleasure to highlight uh, some key takeaways regarding the pediatric regulation discussion. Um, well, uh, first of all, we heard uh, it loud and clear. Um, changes are uh, imminent and changes are urgently needed and can make a transformational and life-saving change uh, for children and adolescents with cancer. Um, we need to um, uh, drive uh, the medicine development based on the biology of the disease and not based on the adult indication. And this would uh, indeed align um, uh, the European um, regulatory framework uh, with that already in place in the US. Uh, we do need to reduce delays. Children. Uh, cannot wait for life-saving medicines, and survivors uh, do deserve to get access um, to uh, novel treatments that will reduce the side uh, effects in the long term. Uh, we need to facilitate uh, and also engage in dialogue with industry to understand what kind of incentives can uh, be uh, most suited to incentivize first-in-child development. Uh, uh, drugs that are really targeted to the specific uh, needs and the specific cancers that only occur in children. Uh, the repurposing uh, is also uh, a very important orientation uh, uh, to be able to access and develop further the drugs where the development in adults has been stopped for uh, one reason or another. Uh, the community is ready. Uh, there are uh, platforms in place, uh, with Accelerate being uh, clearly uh, one key uh, example of a dialogue that is ongoing with all stakeholders, including regulators, uh, academia, parents, patients and survivors, and industry, as well as, um, well, really, uh, indeed, the whole of the community to together formulate targeted solutions uh, to advance uh, and accelerate uh, innovation for children and adolescents with cancer. Uh, this is a unique opportunity given to us by the EU uh, following the European Parliament uh, resolution on the pediatric regulation and now the Commission uh, uh, consultation that is open. We invite you all to uh, get informed about the recommendations that our societies are putting forward on this occasion. This will be shared with you uh, in the follow-up email um, uh, following this event. Um, and uh, I would like to stress that the time to act is indeed now, um, and uh, it's a great opportunity to uh, make a life-saving change. Thank you very much on behalf of all the organizers. <laughs>